Hi, everyone. Welcome to J Talks Live, our final show of this season. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti, the host of the webcast series uh, and the podcast More. Today, we are discussing the U.S. with all of its polarized politics, the pandemics, the protests over race-related police brutality, and an upcoming presidential election. And at the helm of it all, of course, Donald Trump. My guest today is Susan B. Glasser, staff writer with The New Yorker. She writes a column on Trump's Washington, and uh, she will help shed some insight for us into this chaos. Susan Glasser's award-winning career includes serving as editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy, the founding editor of Politico magazine, and Moscow bureau chief at The Washington Post. But first, the Canadian, before we get to Susan, I just want to uh, say that the CJF, the Canadian Journalism Foundation, would like to thank BMO Financial Group for making this J Talks series possible. And the CJF would also like to thank Cision for its support, as well as CPAC. And I'll give you a few helpful notes for this webcast. If your internet quality is poor, click on the click here to switch stream button on your computer to uh, view at a lower bandwidth. The video quality will decrease when you do that, but the audio should remain the same. If you are having technical issues, you can also click on the request help bubble on the bottom right corner of this webcast page, and your help request will be emailed back to the email address that you have provided. The webcast is 40 minutes long. I will chat with our guest and then take your questions. Many of you have already sent some in and I've been going through those and I'll bring in as many as I can. You can submit your questions at any time using the questions tab. And if you want to tweet about this tag, the, the, this talk, the hashtag is JTalksLive. So, Susan Glasser, uh, welcome, and let's begin. Thank you so much, Anna Marie. I'm just delighted to be with you today. And, you know, I have to say, I've, I've made a list here, you know, uh, uh, in just in the last week, all of these different issues in the midst of a pandemic, racism laid bare, anger in the streets, unidentifiable police surrounding the White House perimeter. Days ago, Mr. Trump pulled the U.S. out of the WHO. He tried to decree a legal change in a peak of anger over Twitter, then he ends up in a bunker as unarmed protesters are way outside the White House. Then there's the photo op. Then there are the top military men, including his former defense secretary, who have accused him of violating constitutional rights. Where do we start? You know, I'm exhausted just listening to that list. Uh, you know, are you, uh, you guys in Canada open for uh, uh, journalists seeking refuge? Uh, I'm, wondering, been... I'm, I'm wondering about your own journalistic whiplash. <laughs> Well, that's exactly right. You know, it's um, uh, it's been often observed, but is nonetheless true for, for having been much commented on that uh, these are exhausting times and that, you know, the, the sort of Donald Trump as human fog machine, right? Uh, you know, there's so many controversies that the fog is simply, you can't remember yesterday's outrage because there are so many new ones today. And that phenomenon, which has been with us for the last few years, has just accelerated uh, you know, in the last week, you know, remember a week ago when he was at war with Twitter? Uh, that seems nostalgic to me, you know, at this point. Uh, last night, after I filed my column, we live here in Washington, about 10 minutes only from, from downtown Washington. We got in the car, um, my husband, who's also a journalist, and I, and uh, went down, parked a few blocks away from the White House, uh, a block away from where uh, armed uh, uh, federal troops were guarding uh, the streets, blocking off the streets in a, in a military Humvee. Uh, we walked over to the protests uh, in front of uh, the now famous St. John's Church. Uh, there were hundreds of, you know, essentially mostly young people, black and white, probably a majority of white citizens. Um, you know, they were being guarded by uh, heavily armed and unidentified personnel. And it was really, it was an extraordinary sight for me to see it happening in the United States, having been a foreign correspondent across the former Soviet Union, uh, having been in uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's just not something I've ever seen here, certainly in the context of uh, the US military or, or federal troops, um, essentially confronting people with signs, you know, 21 year olds with signs. And, you know, there was this line of people 
uh, at the sort of very front of it. And the young people, they were holding up their phones and they were trying to engage the individual troops. And they were, you know, talking to them and saying like, you know, when you take off that uniform, you're just one of us, you know, why are you here? What are you doing? Why won't you say who you are? It's un-American. And this one young guy, he started shouting and I have it on tape, it just, it was so moving to me. He said, you know, it wasn't democratic politicians. It wasn't socialism. It was you. You're the ones who are hurting American democracy. This looks like Venezuela. And you know, I was born in Venezuela, so I can tell you what it looks like there. This doesn't look like America. And it was, it was just a very profound moment to me. I, I want to just pick up on the fact that the um, some of the military personnel or the, some of the, the the guards around the White House, that perimeter, do not have any identifiable insignias. Do we know who they are? Are they actually police or military or are they private? Well, that's that's correct. I, I saw it with my own eyes. Uh, you know, there were two uh, flanks yes, last night uh, in front of, you know, guarding uh, the square. Now they've pushed out the perimeter. So you're no longer even close to the white house. They're essentially taking territory each day away from the public. Uh, but so on one side were these big burly guys, uh, who looked like paramilitary type troops. Uh, uh, and, uh, they had no identification of any kind. Uh, there might be federal prison guard riot police, uh, that unit has been identified as being participating here. Uh, no one knew exactly. Uh, they would not speak at all to the protesters. On the other side of the square, uh, there were what looked like probably national guardsmen in, in combat fatigues from another state. They were much younger. They were much less threatening. They, they looked like, you know, young men in military uniforms. You know, they were probably weekend warriors from uh, middle America, essentially. And they looked very uncomfortable. Uh, and much more human, I have to say, <laughs> than the very threatening, you know, the guys on the other side of the street, they look like they were in some kind of RoboCop type movie. I mean, you know, it was very dystopian, frankly. Yeah, you know, and in the last 24 hours or so, we have seen top military people, among them the former De Defense Secretary General Jim Mattis, the former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen, the acting secretary of the Army, Ryan D. McCarthy, and as well as John Allen, retired general who led fights against ISIS, all making public statements suggesting the president is violating the Constitution and reminding everyone that Americans have the constitutional right to protest. How significant is that criticism coming from generals and retired generals? Well, uh, you know, I can give you two answers. The answer, uh, you know, in your heart is that you want it to be extremely significant. Uh, these are men who have spent decades in service to their country, who uh, have served uh, uh, in a completely nonpartisan way, uh, presidents of both parties, administrations of both parties who swear their oaths to the Constitution and not to any individual. Uh, they are, I, I know all of the men uh, that you mentioned, with the exception of the acting secretary of the Army, I've met all of the others. Uh, I believe them all to be deeply patriotic and, and to disagree with each other, by the way. John Allen uh, came out in the 2016 campaign, uh, already a retired general at this time, and endorsed Hillary Clinton and uh, actually had a big rift with Jim Mattis, who uh, was a very close friend of his and who told him it was the wrong thing to do uh, and believed that fundamentally uh, that was risking the independence of the military for even a retired general of the stature of John Allen to speak out. So the fact that they're now both on the same side is something very significant and remarkable. However, uh, the flip side is uh, Donald Trump, as you know, has succeeded in part uh, in exposing uh, the uh, hollowness of our institutions and the lack of uh, leadership in the country anymore that has a followership. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I think it also plays right into his narrative that the elites are against me, whether they're the military elites or the business elites or uh, the media elites. So uh, it doesn't necessarily harm him politically in the way you might think. But but again, it, it's a grave moment. Uh, and I think people are, are considering it to be a very grave moment here. 
And I should just uh, correct myself. When I said acting secretary, um, Ryan D. McCarthy is the secretary of the army. I meant acting in the sense that he's not retired. He's uh, actively Herman, in current. that role. Yeah, current, the current. Um, so uh, uh, there had been some speculation that this is one area that Mr. Trump might actually feel um, a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit he would feel that that kind of criticism in a way he hasn't felt the other criticism, but but you're suggesting maybe not. I don't think that uh, you know Trump feels anything in and of itself. Uh, you know he has an overriding interest right now in his own political survival, uh, and I believe that uh, that is the dominant and overriding factor in any decision that he's making right now. And so uh, to the extent he, he thinks it harms him politically, he would take notice of it. And then of course, you know, we've all observed, uh, you know, the core characteristic of Trump, which he himself speaks about, which is uh, his refusal uh, to uh, simply take a punch and move on. Uh, you know, if somebody lands a blow on him, he is a, just an absolute and core believer in punching back, uh, no matter who is, is making the punch. And so, uh, I believe that if anything, it will uh, stiffen uh, his resolve. And, and again, it's it's a core belief of Trump that long predates his entry into public life, uh, that demonstrations of strength, as he defines them, which include uh, shows of military might and overwhelming force, even against unarmed protesters, is something that is uh, just wired into him. Uh, you know, there's a great column by Nick Kristof today who... 31 years ago today, covered the Tiananmen uh, Square massacre uh, uh, for the New York Times in China. And uh, he points out that, uh, of course, the United States uh, and its politicians at the time were united in condemning this, uh, even friends of China like George H.W. Bush. And yet there was one voice in the United States who uh, praised the strong response by Chinese leaders, and that man was Donald Trump 31 years ago. And today, Mr. Trump was tweeting uh, law and order in capital letters with exclamation marks uh, still. Uh, I'm wondering if you see um, any kind of a weakening of, the, of the, 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 the senators, the Republican senators who have been so quick to support him, given the events of the past week and the number of people on the streets and, and what we've seen. So... Uh you know, the overriding story of uh, the Trump era here in Washington is, in fact, uh, the his successful takeover of the Republican Party, in particular, the Republican elected officials on Capitol Hill uh, in the Senate, as well as the House of Representatives. And of course, these same senators uh, spoke with a unanimous voice just a few months ago in uh, voting to acquit Donald Trump in the Senate trial, with the lone exception of Mitt Romney. However, this morning, uh, you had a very interesting comment from Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who was one of the senators who was seen as on the fence in that Senate impeachment trial. She ultimately voted not only not to have any witnesses in that trial, uh, uh, making it questionable as to what kind of a trial it was, but uh, also voted to acquit Trump this morning. She said, well, General Mattis spoke for me, and he really aired uh, concerns that uh, I think we all have to share and take seriously and, you know, strongly suggested she was considering uh, coming out against Trump's reelection and uh, basically endorsing this remarkable comments from General Mattis of yesterday in which he essentially compared Donald Trump, the man he served as defense secretary uh, with the Nazis and said it was un-American what he had done on Monday night. So that was a remarkable statement by Lisa Murkowski. We'll see uh, if she follows through. A few other, a very small number of other Republican senators have uh, questioned it. But again, you know, the story is, uh, I would say, the acquiescence of the whole much more so than it is the dissent of a small handful, at least for now. They've made their political bet uh, and... Uh, you know, it, it, it may not be paying off for them, but it would be very, very hard for them to switch gears at this point unless they felt their own existential threat, uh, survival was at, at stake. You know, you've described the president as a super spreader of distraction, and you've labeled some of what he's been doing and saying and tweeting as his own operation obfuscation. How much of what we're seeing now is part of that deliberate effort 
to keep diverting attention or to confuse? Well, it's very interesting, right? You know, for the last uh, two and a half, three months, uh, you know, Donald Trump has wanted to change the subject desperately uh, from the coronavirus pandemic and his own botched handling of it, right? And he, uh, of course, you know, denied uh, that it was coming to the United States. Then he said it was going to go to zero. Then he said it was going to go away uh, uh, in the warm weather. Then he said there would only be a few people who would uh, die of it. And then he said, never mind, let's just reopen. And so he has been really eager to change the subject and to create other controversies. Um, I'm not sure that uh, a massive uh, national protest movement uh, against racial violence was uh, the distraction he had in mind. And what I've been struck by actually just the last couple of days, it's, it's early yet, but if you look at some of the early polls, his remarks, uh, even from Republicans, on handling race relations are even worse than they were on the coronavirus. So this might be the one distraction, uh, you know, that is even more politically damaging to him uh, than the other distractions he threw up. So I, I'm not sure this is what he had in mind, frankly. Yeah, and we've noticed that he said so very little about um, the whole issue of race and what is really playing out on the streets than what that is emblematic of. Um, he made a comment, what was it, two days ago? I can't remember, everything happened so fast, but that MAGA loves black people. Um, he said almost nothing to the, the kind of pain that we are seeing um, you know, in the manifestations of, of these protests. Um, Talk to me a little bit about how that, you know, how, how you're reading that, how you're watching that. Well, look, again, to draw the through line from the pandemic to uh, the sort of political unrest that we're seeing right now in the United States, uh, you know, empathy is just not part of brand Trump. Uh, it's not who he is uh, as a person. And it, you're never going to hear it from him, whether it's about 100,000 Americans dying in a short period of time or uh, it's about uh, the agony of uh, police brutality and, and unjust racism in America. It's just not who he is, and you're never going to hear that. And if you did, it wouldn't be genuine. And he, he, he understands that on some level. So part of it is his own calculation and understanding that it worried to say that. But uh, it's, it's even more than that. Uh, it, that Donald Trump uh, has continually uh, both inflamed racial tensions in the United States and actually profited from them. Uh, you know, remember that, uh, you know, that's the original sin uh, of the Trump political persona uh, was him uh, essentially making racial, racially tinged comments about Barack Obama and, uh, you know, suggesting that Barack Obama was not born in the United States, uh, which is essentially a racist conspiracy theory that he and others advanced with obviously no basis in fact. And that is the entire basis of his public persona and political appeal. So Donald Trump isn't going to abandon the racism that got him into the White House, number one. Number and one. We, have, we have seen him obsessed with Barack Obama for Correct. quite a well, while now. Um, What's so remarkable for a man who is, you know, has that at the core of his political identity, uh, just yesterday, he tweeted from the White House while surrounded by these and protected by these unarmed, by these massively armed federal troops. He tweeted from the White House that he has done more for African Americans than any president in U.S. history, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln. That's a direct quote. So is he completely delusional or does he think this uh, boosters that this boosts him among a certain uh, demographic of supporters. Right. So, I mean, pretty clearly he's not actually aiming for black votes there. Uh, you know, the uh, African American community has consistently actually been the strongest demographic group against uh, Donald Trump. And I think, you know, we're talking like over 90%, uh, you know, identifying as democratic at this point. Uh, so why is he saying comments like that? Uh, Donald Trump has a terrible problem with suburban white voters, uh, in particular suburban white women voters, and he will not win re-election, uh, uh, even with our electoral map uh, of the states favoring Republicans. He will not win re-election unless he can keep enough of those white suburban voters who uh, don't consider themselves to be racist and, you know, aren't particularly 
uh, desiring of having a president, even of their own party, uh, who is so explicitly identified as one. So I believe that, you know, those comments throughout his presidency, actually, about African Americans are aimed uh, probably at a certain segment of white voters uh, and trying to persuade them that it's okay to, to vote for him. And you actually, um, in a in a in a big feature in the New Yorker, actually followed a never Trumper Republican who um, a woman who's been really trying to parse some of that and really pull out those votes that that were Trump that that can be shifted. Um, kind of making the point that you don't need all Trump supporters to shift. You just need some very, uh, you need some laser focus or they, they believe they need some laser focus to shift that, the, those votes. Well, that's right. It's very interesting. So, uh, you know, that's uh, one theory of the case, right? That Donald Trump, uh, remember, he won election in 2016 in a big upset where he actually lost the American popular vote, uh, but he won uh, the Electoral College because of just three states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Uh, and these are essentially industrial uh, Rust Belt states of the you know, Midwest or, uh, and uh, where a certain number of uh, moderate suburban Republican votes were, were essentially the key to the outcome. And so uh, this piece that I wrote was looking at uh, a, a lifetime Republican strategist and activist who is very anti-Trump and, you know, mostly has experienced the last few years as a series of almost horrifying out-of-body experiences where she's losing and losing and losing and realizing that the people that she worked with and was friends with uh, for years were not who she thought and have one by one made accommodations to Trump. And, and that's what people do, uh, you know, in Washington or in any capital city in, in Canada as well. Uh, they make accommodation to power. Uh, and yet, realizing that voters uh, 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 didn't necessarily make those same calculations. And uh, she's been doing intensive focus groups with uh, mostly women who uh, identify as Republicans who admit that they were Trump voters in 2016, but uh, are varying degrees of uncertain. And I listened in on those. And, you know, what I found is that they really, really don't like Donald Trump, uh, but they weren't very interested in the Democratic Party either. And so, you know, that made them an up for grabs group of people. How do you interpret uh, Joe Biden's message um, this uh, in the last couple of days as well? Well, I think, again, you know, you would think that uh, Donald Trump has offered more material for any politician to, to work with uh, than one could possibly imagine. I do think that, uh, you know, Biden and his team seem to understand and seem to have a clear theory of the case that as long as the election is a referendum on Donald Trump and his incumbency, uh, they're likely to win. Uh, if Trump succeeds in changing the subject or making it more about Biden, uh, it would be more competitive. Uh, so you know, essentially Biden has has tried to remain focused on, uh, you know, he's a healer, he's a uniter, not a divider. This is not the America we live in. Uh, uh, you know, it's a choice that America faces, America or Trump. And, you know, those are, that's the message right now. It's very, pretty clear. Um, and I will ask you more about election because we have a lot of those questions coming in, but I'll just add, before we get there, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the um, things that Mr. Trump has done, and again, in the last couple of days, that like pulling the United States of the WHO, canceling the G7, inviting Mr. Putin not only to join the group of G7, which would make it G8 again, um, but also inviting him to the States. Um, through your prism as a, a former foreign correspondent uh, in the former Soviet republics, um, what are you thinking? Well, again, you know, one of the enduring uh, and troubling mysteries of the Trump era is uh, his uh, extreme fascination with Vladimir Putin and obsession uh, uh, with uh, bringing close ties to him personally, uh, as well as on a policy level. It's something that is essentially not supported by uh, uh, American leaders, politicians of either party, Republicans as well as Democrats, uh, you know, pretty much disagree with Donald Trump about this. And yet he has uh, what, what seems to be almost a personal fascination with uh, Vladimir Putin. And again, the through line of many of the controversies 
of the Trump era go back to Vladimir Putin, uh, Trump's insistence back in the campaign in 2016 of uh, talking, praising Putin, uh, contrasting his leadership favorably with that of Barack Obama, insisting that he would consider rolling back sanctions, which uh, is uh, an issue uh, uh, that was what was discussed in the controversial phone call between uh, Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, and um, the former Russian ambassador to the United States, the, the call that led to Flynn's firing uh, led him to plead guilty and now is somehow been reinvented by Trump as an example of, his, of Flynn's persecution. So that was all about Putin and sanctions, which is why I bring it up now. Uh, and yet here you have once again, uh, even though the Congress of the United States re Republicans uh, uh, have passed a law saying, you know, Donald Trump doesn't have the right to get rid of those sanctions, just like Donald Tri Trump does not actually have the right to unilaterally reinvite Vladimir Putin to the G7. He was thrown out of the G7 for invading Crimea, which he still holds. Uh, and uh, even Boris Johnson, the prime minister of Great Britain and an ally of Trump, came out very quickly and said, you know, we would veto that. We're not in favor of that. Uh, Canada uh, as well. And so why is Donald Trump risking political capital, both domestically and internationally, on behalf of Vladimir Putin in the middle of the election year? I pose it as a question because it remains a question without an answer. It's almost as if... Um you know, I mean, as we watch Mr. Trump and the many things he has said and how he conducts himself, it's almost as if there is even more of a spiral happening right now. I don't, I don't know if I'm right about that, 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 um, th that he, he seems to be almost like staggering from pillar to post in, in how he's approaching everything. Well, it's interesting that even uh, given the level of kind of self-created controversies the last few years, you now have the combination of Trump's continued penchant to create uh, controversy col colliding with actual externally imposed uh, crises that were not of his making, uh, which largely he escaped in his first few years in office. So that combination, I think, has, has led things to feel like they are teetering uh, you know, on the brink even more so than they have been. Uh, it's, it, it does feel like a particularly uh, unhinged moment in American politics, doesn't it? Mm, what, what did you call it? It's a mix of the menacing and the absurd. Well, there is that too, yes. Uh, yeah. You know, if you go back and read, you know, the, the great uh, literature of, you know, Eastern Europe uh, during Soviet domination or, you know, other people living through moments of, uh, dictatorship and tyranny, uh, you forget that a lot of the great narratives there are about the absurdity uh, uh, and ridiculousness of uh, strongmen as well as their uh, menacingness. And, uh, you know, that's just a quality that, that Trump has in space. He's, he's a pretty absurdist character. Hmm. I, I want to go to some of the questions. Uh, there's a question from Jim Brody who asks, uh, what is Trump's kryptonite? What types of stories will finally shock his base into seeing him for who he is and who they've enabled? Well, so those are almost two different questions. It's a great question. One is what's his personal kryptonite? And then the other is what would actually uh, uh, harm him uh, with his political base and cause these followers of his to, to break away. Uh, I think on the personal level, one is easier to answer. Um, Trump, clearly, uh, you know, has a lot of issues, as they say. <laughs> uh, and in a way, we've all become armchair Trumpologists or, you know, uh, shrinks in the last few years, uh, as he seems to be sort of inflicting his own personal uh, drama and troubles on, on the nation and the world writ large. Uh, who knows what's really inside that head. But one thing that does trigger Donald Trump uh, is uh, personal criticism uh, that gets to, uh, you know, him and his father. Uh, clearly, his father was a dominant uh, personality who shaped him in some, uh, what appears to be highly negative way. Uh, and so, uh, you know, certainly, I've talked to those who have made it their mission to get inside Trump's head. And they, they think uh, that the key is to um, uh, talk about his daddy issues uh, and to raise uh, uh, his, the disapproval of his father uh, at every turn on a personal level. 
Um, he just, in general, cannot handle uh, a certain kind of criticism. It, it makes him uh, absolutely lash out in ways that, that tend to be not to his own benefit. Um, as far as his followers, what's remarkable uh, is that even though you may be reading a lot of coverage right now about how Trump is losing in the polls and you know Biden has had a pretty consistent lead and now that seems to be opening up even a little bit, I would say read those with a caveat. The caveat is this, essentially, he still has a poll I just looked at this morning, about a 40% national approval rating. That's exactly the same approval rating that he had in January before the pandemic, before the greatest economic collapse since the Great Depression, before national protests that have resulted in the biggest wave of violence since 1968. So nothing will shake these people. There's almost nothing, it appears, uh, that Donald Trump can't do and have almost 40% of the American public still approving of him. And of course, that speaks to the fact that there is no clear, um, there's, there's, you know, anyone who thinks the Democrats have a cakewalk, it's just not true um, in the coming election. But given the way things are going, is it even a certainty that the November elections will proceed? Well, this is a good question. Uh, and it's a question that many Americans, uh, you know, have started to get jittery and, and wonder about. It actually, Time Magazine recently asked Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, who also works in the White House, this question. And he said, uh, well, there's nothing that we're considering at this time uh, <laughs> that would change that date. Now, I would just remind listeners that the Constitution of the United States prescribes uh, the date, time, and manner of the general election in this country. Uh, and I believe that that is an unwavering uh, date. Now, what are the conditions under which we're going to be voting? Those vary widely from state and locality. Uh, it is under the control of different state officials. And as you know, there are already many troubles that predate Donald Trump when it comes to having equal access uh, to voting and, uh, you know, making sure that those conditions for a free and fair vote exist. And uh, in the coronavirus context, uh, making sure that there's access to uh, mail-in ballots for those who need them, uh, you know, is something that already has become politicized. Trump has already been suggesting that the election is going to be rigged, which is something that he did in 2016 as well when he thought he was going to lose. Uh, and so I think it's going to be a very, very contentious process by which we vote. But I don't have any question that we will be voting in November. And I, as I say, there are lots of questions. Uh, uh, Canadians are, um, you know, both fascinated and, and um, on edge watching all of this unfold. Uh, David Ellenbass asks, what happens when, and I'll say when and if or when, but what happens when Trump loses in November and refuses to accept the result? How is the constitutional crisis resolved? Well, again, I, you know, um, obviously we're living in a moment when many once previously unthinkable things are occurring. Uh, so I don't rule anything out, but I have to say this has been a scenario ever since, uh, you know, uh, Trump was elected. People have talked about this question saying, well, he'll never leave willingly. Uh, you know, I, I do believe uh, that if he loses and he is certified to have done so, and, it, you know, the Constitution, again, stipulates a process by which uh, the electors, uh, remember, we don't have a national popular vote, we, ha we vote, and then each state has electors uh, who then are named, who become the Electoral College, and they meet uh, before the end of this year. Uh, 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 if the Electoral College has met and certified uh, that Donald Trump has lost, then, then he's out. Uh, and I don't believe there's anything he can do. Now, you know, the, the scarier scenario, of course, is an uncertain election result. Uh, let's say it's very close on election night, and then there are millions of uncounted uh, mailed-in ballots and absentee ballots, uh, and he, he questions the legitimacy of those. You know, that's where things are up in the air. But I think, you know, once we have a certified election result, um, you know, the entire machinery of the U.S. government from that point forward just is not in his hands.
Um, there's a question from Adam Plackett related to that. There's currently a case before the Supreme Court, which will determine whether electoral college voters have to vote for whichever candidate won the majority of votes in their state. I don't understand how this issue has got as far as the Supreme Court as it would make a mockery of the whole presidential election if they were able to vote for the losing candidate. Can you explain? Well, again, we just do not have a straightforward um you know, direct democracy system here in the United States. And many states already do have laws. Uh, I forget the current number, uh, but a, a large number of states already have laws that in effect bind uh, their electors uh, to follow the election results, uh, the popular election results in their states. But it's not a requirement. Uh, and once it's there, it's there. And by the way, if there is a tie in the electoral college, then it goes to the House of Representatives, uh, where uh, you know they are not under any uh, obligations connected with the popular vote. Although interestingly, this happened only once before in our history in 1876. But it doesn't just go to the House of Representatives, uh, and each member of the House of Representatives gets a vote. It goes by state delegations. Well, right now, of the current Congress, right now Democrats hold the majority in the House of Representatives. However, they do not hold the majority. I think it's only by like one state of the state delegations. So it's quite possible. Again, I, I don't think this will happen, but uh, just so people understand the process, that's, that's how it works. Um, uh, Esther Ankin sends a, a question. How would you assess the structural and systemic damage Mr. Trump will leave behind even if he's defeated? Seems like so many institutions of democracy are undermined. Well, you know, as you might imagine, this is a question that, you know, lots of people are asking themselves. And I do think there would be an enormous difference between a one-term Trump presidency and a two-term Trump president, presidency in terms of uh, lasting changes in trajectory or, um, you know, uh, fundamental uh, disrupting of our institutions. However, you know, the uh, challenging and chattering of norms, the fact that so many of the things that we so thought were core tenets of our democracy turn out to be actually norms rather than, than uh, rules or laws that are encoded uh, into permanent behavior means that uh, surely uh, he will have left his mark on Washington, even if uh, you know a new president comes in and, and tries to undo much of what he's done. For example, uh, the long trajectory of the last few decades in both parties holding the White House has been toward increasing executive authority. Uh, and, um, you know, a future president may justify some of what Trump is doing on the basis that, well, I'm using these powers toward good ends and not toward bad ends. Uh, and, uh, you know, so some of the powers may be hard to undo. Uh, the uh, assault on the press uh, as you know, it's not just Republicans uh, who, who like to blame the messenger, even though we've certainly never had uh, any president uh, of any party who has attacked the media in such a sustained and calculated way. Uh, we've never had a president who called the press the enemies of the people. Uh, but with that stipulation, uh, you know, there are certainly scenarios you can imagine where uh, leaders, uh, a Democratic uh, president would also want to leave in place some of the um, lack of transparency in the executive agencies, for example, that Trump has pursued. Um, I've got another question here. It looks like we're almost out of time, but this might be the, the place to end. Um, and this is about um, uh, the, the wider race and racism issue uh, that the United States is is being reminded of with, with all of these protests. Um, eman this comes from Patricia Deverell. Emancipation never really happened in America. The murder of George Floyd was a modern day lynching. The only difference between historical and present day abuses is that racism is now seen more. Why has the United States never undergone a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Well, you know, it is, it's, it's a powerful question and it's, it's a powerful and sad moment of reckoning uh, in the country. You know, Barack Obama uh, gave a very interesting address yesterday uh, uh, talking about some of these issues. And he made the argument that there is something different, that unlike uh, the protests in the 1960s, uh, 
uh, that this is a much more broad-based and diverse movement supporting Black people in America today. Uh, I certainly have seen in the protests that I've observed here in Washington, D.C., uh, a large outpouring of support for African Americans from uh, white people, from brown people, uh, and that this is not the 1968 of Donald Trump's, uh, you know, divisive imagining, uh, you know, in many ways, our cities have changed. Uh, and I think that's why there is this, this outrage and this uproar uh, over not just George Floyd's killing, but, you know, a spate of uh, killings in recent years and, and a sense that the balance of power is, is skewed uh, in the wrong direction uh, in our cities and with our police departments in ways that have to be corrected. Now, Barack Obama, uh, you know, uh, is of course an optimist at heart, as he often used to say, uh, you got to be an optimist if a kid like me can grow up to be the president of the United States of America. And uh, all I would say is that, uh, you know, each generation has to, uh, you know, not take it as settled fact and to write their, their own version of this. It, it's uh, shocking on the one hand that a big headline in the news yesterday was Virginia Governor Ralph Northam says he's going to uh, take down the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee uh, in Richmond, Virginia, the capital. Uh, you know, you could say, how the heck did it take this long for that to happen? Or you could say, well, good, finally, at last. So, you know, I do think that, um, you know, we won't know until it's over how we did, you know, as uh, in our moment in time. But, uh, you know, as horrifying and shocking as it's been as a U.S. citizen to look at uh, our own military uh, blocking young people from uh, their First Amendment rights, the last few days, the flip side is, uh, you know, to see so many people across the country protesting who, who never did before, uh, you know, you could also count that as a sign of progress. So much uh, work for you to do in your coverage of Washington and the, and the Trump administration and Trump himself. Susan, thanks for your insights and uh, for all the work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for all these us. questions. And please save a place for us in Canada. <laughs> well, you know, the border is still mostly closed and people want to know when that's going to change too or what the U.S. will do with it. But we'll uh, save that for another day. Thank you again, Susan. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for sending your questions. That is it for this season of J Talks. Uh, we're really glad you've joined us for these conversations featuring journalists who are covering angles of COVID and its impact. Um, we hope we're able to shed some light on the new reality and uh, the changing reality. There's so many tentacles to this, even more um, than when it first began. If you missed any webcasts, they are all available to view on CJF's website. The J Talks season is over, but there's still one webcast left, and it's a special one. The Canadian Journalism Foundation invites you to join a celebration of journalistic excellence with its virtual CJF award ceremony next Thursday, June 11th. Rick Mercer will host this special online event. CTV's Lisa Laflamme will present the awards. You can watch at one o'clock Eastern time or re the rebroadcast the same evening at 7 p.m. And view the details and register for the virtual ceremony on the CJF website. We hope you will join us. Thank you for watching. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Bye-bye. <laughs>